for someone who's if we, if we take a look back at the at the RPL at the RPL process um, there is a if I move from one firm and I've done a year at one firm and now for some reason I want to move to another firm there's a six month penalty correct compulsory doesn't matter how wonderful I am there will always be a six month penalty can you explain why that is yeah so the six month penalty is really for two reasons the one is to say think twice before you move um, okay. We don't want trainees just hopping between training offices. It doesn't allow for a consistent experience and it doesn't help the training office either. They invest a lot of um, you know, time and energy and money in the trainees. And then if you know they jump ship in the third year, um, that's one of the concerns that has been raised previously. So that is one of the reasons. And that's why it really is called a penalty. Right. However, there is a second thing to that. You know that if you enter into a new job, it takes a while to integrate into the new office. Right. So the six month penalty is really saying, okay, so you've left this training environment, which you were familiar with and which you knew the processes. Now you're moving into a new training environment. So it's going to take you a little while to get up to speed. Mm. <laughs> so that is one of the, one of the reasons, well, those are the two reasons really for the penalty. Having said that, there are a number of times where you move training contract and it really isn't through any fault of your own. You had every intention of seeing out the training contract at that office, but perhaps the office closed or you had to relocate because for example, you had a sick family member that you needed to go and look after. Right. So I'm going out to of my control. Yeah. Out of your control, not a voluntary move. Mm. We would then, the training regulation sets out very specific circumstances where we would not impose a penalty okay. at all based okay. on the training regulations. Um, but a mere disinclination or a sense that you would get better exposure, even though you're getting plenty of exposure mm -hmm. for your competencies, or you decide you want to be in banking instead of audit, mm -hmm. that's a voluntary move. Yeah. It might be good for your career. You might have made an informed decision, but really it's your choice to move training offices. Right. Yeah. So you have a right to move, but you don't have a right to have the penalty waived. Right. You can apply for it. And if it's in terms of the training regulations, we will, we will waive it. Mm. And sometimes there are mitigating circumstances. So sometimes on paper, it looks like it was voluntary, but actually when we dig down into it, there were it's factors. Else, and yeah. our regulations committee would consider that in looking at, a, at an application. Right. Yeah, because I think, you know, a large... Um, and again, you, you know, you'll know this more than me, like a large part of, of where that comes from is people who start their first year of articles and totally hate their existence. <laughs> you know, they, um, and the, you know, it's, it's, they, they really don't like it or whatever. And they feel yeah. that they made a mistake, you know, that the firm that they chose was the wrong one. And so they want to leave because uh, it's too stressful or, you know, they don't like it or whatever. And I think to, to a large extent um, that happens because they're, actually not really aware of what they're getting into to start yeah. off with you know so they, they're like this is this is a really horrible experience and so therefore it must be the firm you know it must mm -hmm. it's just because it's if i went to another firm it wouldn't be the same mm -hmm. um and yeah I, I when i when i get that from 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 people i always tell them like i hate to tell you but it's, it's not the firm it's the process <laughs> unless there's something very specific going on and again then you know, they, they, they need to speak to you unless there's something very specific going on. Articles are not easy, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not the work. I think this is where students is like, I'm happy to do the difficult calculations, you know, but that's not what's difficult about articles. It's not the calculations. It's not the theory. It's all the other stuff. It's dealing mm -hmm. with stressful situations, deadlines, other people doing, you know, not, not, you know, not understanding how other people interact, dealing with clients, dealing with it's all mm. the non, and I think yeah. that's what students are like, oh, but it's all this other stuff, like the calculations mm. I can do, but it's, you know, the people and the teams and the, this and the frustrations and the procrastination and the deadlines, like that's the stuff, like, I think my firm is bad at. I'm like, no, 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 that's, yeah. that's life. <laughs> that's the real world. You know, go mm. to another firm and then you're going to have that and you're going to have another six months of it as well because mm. now you've got a penalty. So mm. there you are mm. and just... <laughs> Yes, so I'd like to actually just say say a few things on that. So yes, yes the, and it's something that I the 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 beauty of the training contract is how you grow as a professional. Yes. When you step out and you look back to when you came in on day one and you realize how much you've grown as a 
person. I right. think that's the thing. Right. You can still do the stuff that you could do when you came in on day one. And yes, you've practiced a bit more and you, you've applied the university knowledge and you've had yeah. a chance to show that you can do it as a, yeah. you know, you can do it practically. But the, the biggest growth opportunity mm -hmm. is as a professional. Mm -hmm. And our emphasis in CA 2025, and I think you spoke to Mandy about that previously, yeah is yeah. that we really shifting focus in the training program. We're not going to place as much emphasis on assessing your technical competence. What we really want to see is whether you can prove yourself as a professional. Yeah. So that when we put you out there as a, as a future CA or AGA SA, is that you are able to function as expected mm -hmm. as a yeah. professional. Yeah. So I think that's the one thing I wanted to say. And then I would say, if you are thinking about moving offices before you do attend a trainee event with other trainees from other offices yeah that's a good Talk point because what i've loved about sessions that i facilitated with trainees previously is that the biggest thing the biggest takeaway is i'm i'm not alone in this it's yeah, not no. my office no. and the, one of the best experiences i had had a very mature trainee i think she she was in her 50s she had gone back into a training contract okay and at the end, she said to me, you know, I thought it was because of my age. Yeah. It's not. It's I'm not. a trainee. Yeah. That's all. I'm a trainee. I'm okay. having exactly the same experience as everyone around me. Yeah. So yeah. As you say, it's definitely part of the process, but the process is actually there to, to teach you. Yeah. And it's to learn from all of those opportunities and mm -hmm. to see those challenges as opportunities in the mm -hmm. training contract. Agreed. Yeah. And I think I, I, I do... I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that because it is a very, uh, it's a very topical thing from, from my perspective, not necessarily from students' perspective, <laughs> um, is the value and the importance of the non-technical stuff mm -hmm. is your biggest, you know, that is your biggest learning curve, generally is the, the biggest stress factor without necessarily realizing it. And it's, you know, it's the biggest value that you have um, mm -hmm. is all quite frankly, is all the non-technical stuff, you know, yeah. is your ability to deal with stressful situations, your ability to meet deadlines, your ability to solve problems that don't come out of a textbook, mm -hmm. to think on your feet, to lead, to manage, to supervise, to unpack difficult situations. You know, all of that is the stuff that's going to make you lose sleep at night. You know, that's mm -hmm. the stuff that's going to reduce you to tears mm -hmm. because, well, one, to be perfectly honest, that's, you know, you were never taught this at university mm -hmm. and that, you know, like, we, you know, we can talk about that in different aspects and whatever, and that needs to be shifted. But, you know, you spent your time learning how to do deferred tax calculations. And when you get into the real world, what brings you to your knees is the fact that you've got to do it by tomorrow morning and it's now 10 o'clock at night and you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> that, like, that's what's going to bring you to you. And there's no textbook. There's no suggested answer. You can't go and look in the textbook. There's no phone a friend, but you know that your manager is looking for it at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning and you're like, now what do I do? <laughs> where do I go I'm on my own that's the stuff that's going to bring you to your knees so the the professional component generally does add the most stress and I think that's the stuff that so many people are like I think I should leave my office you know I should go I should go somewhere else mm. um mm. so yeah I absolutely agree like the professional stuff is going to be the killer that's going mm. to be the stuff that you know that 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 you struggle with the most mm. Um, how how can often I just, sorry, sorry. can I jump in there again as yes, well? Yes, yes, yes. So that is precisely why when somebody says to me, "How do I choose? How do I choose a training office?" Right. I say to them, pick somewhere that you feel you can work for three years or four years or five years, however long it's going to be. So it's so important to pick on environment. You're going to get the same experience at the end of the day, and when I when I say the same experience, I mean you going to get your training contract signed off you're going to be signed off against yeah, those you all have to do the same competencies you all exactly. have to take the same boxes yeah yeah everybody seems to be so concerned about that elective it's like well if i don't go and do financial management how am i going to move there most people qualify in order to practice yes. and move into commerce and industry yeah there are very few that go that route some go that route and then say oh gosh i really should have done audits and then they go across that way but that's the 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 lesser part, mm, and mm. it's not essential. You can come through audit and move into whatever afterwards, and you can go through commerce and industry and move into whatever you like afterwards. The, 
what makes the article ex or the training contract, and you keep saying articles, I'm so used to saying training contract. <laughs> the training contract experience the, the smoothest yeah. is if the people that you're working with, you believe you can approach, you can talk to. Mm -hmm. So that when you interview at a training office, I think that's one of the biggest things is to find out whether this is a, an entity that you can see yourself spending the next three years yeah. and, and learning. Yeah. Uh, rather than... I'm ticking all the technical stuff. Yes, it looks great. I can do an overseas secondment. And yes, I can do a, um, you know, I can do all this fancy stuff and I'm going to see listed entities. I want to say, so what? You can see all of that afterwards. You need to <laughs> survive your training contract. But it, it's <laughs> not good. survive. <laughs> it is survive. But it's exactly, it's exactly what you were yeah. talking about. There are challenges in the training contract that you are not going to anticipate. No. I remember no. in my first six months, I also wanted to leave. And the best okay. advice that I got was stay another six months. And if you feel the same way, then leave. And I tell you what, the entire experience changed. I just oh. needed another six months. I just needed to become a little bit more senior, have a bit, bit of a different yeah. uh, role in the, yeah. in the whole process. Certainly. And, you know, the growth, the growth just comes automatically in a, in yeah. a training contract. So yeah. find an entity and people that you believe you can yeah. work with. Yeah. Although this is slightly off, off the, you know, the RPL topic, I think this is such a, you know, this is such an important discussion. The question is, I'm a student, I'm studying, how do I know this? Like, so I'm, I'm in an interview and obviously everybody's on their best behavior on both sides of the table. Everybody's on their best behavior. Um, how, what, how, like, what should I be doing? So to some extent, when, you know, when, when I talk to students and when I talk to people, I'm like, you know, if you can, you know, go and hunt down on LinkedIn or something, go and hunt down some other trainees in that mm. firm and have a chat to them to find out what daily life is like. Mm. Um, because, you, you, you know, you want to you wanna understand what it's like, what the organizational culture is, blah, 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 exact, you know, exactly as you say. So mm. I'm sitting in an interview. How, how do I assess whether or not this is a company that I can work for? Other than they make great coffee. <laughs> like, that might be a contributing factor to your work life. That, enjoyment. That's important. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> I need to know that. So I think, first of all, it is to establish what's important for you mm -hmm. um, and to ask some questions around it. Um, and if you ask the question in the interview, you're going to have to get an answer from, from the people. So ask them about the things that are important to you. What kind of support is there? What do your work groups look like? Um, if I need to take off time, what's the, what's the leave process like? What is your sense of work-life balance in this office? You know, and mm -hmm. I, my experience is that training officers want to develop their trainees. Mm -hmm. There are a few instances where there's a personality clash or there are some, sometimes some very serious issues, but they yeah, are not the norm. Yeah. Okay? And I think the best thing is to please just don't go for only one interview. Go for a few, because mm. then you'll start being able to make that comparison. Mm. And you'll start getting a sense of where you feel you would be mentored well. Um, you'd start seeing people that you could actually already start approaching. Maybe those that when you ask questions afterwards, come back to you. So you can start using those um, those little, little tips and techniques, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, it's if you walk into the interview, remember you're interviewing the training office just as much. much as they're interviewing you yeah. and make sure you go in with your agenda so that you know exactly what you want to find out from them. Yeah. Ask them about exposure, ask them about equitable exposure. Um, you know, we have uh, trainees saying, well, you know, my, my friend gets the exposure to all of these great jobs and I'm not getting it. But on paper, actually, they seem to be getting more broad exposure. Mm. What they're wanting is that very specific client. Mm. But actually, their friend is behind on their development. So, you know, it's, it's very difficult to tell as a trainee whether you're getting what you need. So I'm going to say, assume you're going to get the technical stuff. Yeah. Now you need to know, are you going to be able to build good professional relationships? Are you going to get the guidance that you need, the, su the supervision, the support? So ask questions around that aspect as yeah. well, not just the clients and the right. technical yeah. stuff. And will I be able to apply my accounting knowledge and what's your IT support like? That, you know, yeah. you can, you'll come to that. Yeah. You want to know whether it's an environment that will train you and will allow yeah. you to learn and to make mistakes. Mm. But that's part of the training contract as well. You need to be able to make mistakes. 
that example that you were talking about, you know, 10 o'clock at night and my managers, what prevented you from asking questions? Yeah. You know, Before, saying, yeah. Hey, yeah. I don't know. I'm stuck. Before, yeah. before the work day finished. So that's yes. not <laughs> stuck at night. You know, exactly. it's like 100%. part of that learning, you know, yeah, to be it is. It's okay not to know. Yeah. Yeah. The approachability, uh, like how open, uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely 100%. And I think I find, you know, and I think this is, this is also why so many students um, that are, want to go to the big four because it's safe. You know, they kind of feel as though if I go to the big four, I'll be safe, you know, because, you know, and, and I, I, don't, I don't think that's true because, you know, exactly as you say, you need to assess what you want to take out of articles and what you want from the experience. And um, depending on what you're looking for, the big four may be a good fit for you. It actually may not be what you need for your career. Fine. Um, but I think a lot, of, a lot of people are not necessarily aware of how all this other stuff is going to impact yeah. their articles. Um, it's not about the client's exposure. It's not, a, you know, if you're at a firm where your training officer is really approachable, then it is a lot easier to go in there and go, I don't think that I'm getting the exposure. Like this isn't like, you know, I don't think this is like, I've been on the same kind of, and then they can have the honest conversation with you and go, yeah, sure. Bob is, you know, he's getting like the glamorous client, but let's take a look at what you're doing. Or maybe, yeah, that's a good point. You seem to be planned on all this stuff. Let's perhaps, yeah. let's try and plan you on something else or let's try and shift you here because yeah, you're right. Actually, you need, um, you haven't really had exposure to that. Um, and so the approachability of the people there, yeah. you know, that you deal with is actually going to be crucial. Like, you know, what type of relationship do the trainees have or is the, you know, is their door closed? It's kind of like, what do, you, what you do, you do is your problem. Like, I'm not interested. You know, the approachability and the relationships you build are going to be more important. Because mm -hmm. then you can say, I don't, I don't feel good. Like, I'm too stressed out. This doesn't feel right. Um, mm -hmm. And they go like, you know, this is normal. Let's have it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I, as I say, it's not, it's not entirely the RPL discussion, but I think it is so incredibly valuable because um, you do need to know when you're going into that firm, um, it's, it's about so much more than one, will you hire me? What will you pay me? Will you pay yes. for my laptop? And um, <laughs> you teach me enough study leave is another big question. Yeah, and the study leave. Yeah. 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 For, yeah, well, yeah, I generally tell my students, like, I would prefer you not to have study leave at all. Um, I know it's definitely not a popular approach, but I don't like study leave at all because it just encourages cramming. If you don't have study leave, you will have to study consistently throughout the year. So, <laughs> if it was up to me. Oh, I can I please have that video <laughs> snippet? <laughs> <laughs> I do. Like I, I say, uh, it's a very unpopular thing. But as, as a lecturer, as a teacher, for me, study leave is the biggest curse in the history of mankind. Like this is for me. This is one of the biggest reasons students fail is because they leave so much of their studying to study leave because I'm going to have like three weeks of 24 hours a day. And it never happens. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it never, because now you're renewing your car license because you haven't had a try. You're going to the bank, you're getting extra sleep, you're doing all, like, it never, never. You're playing golf. You're playing, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're getting the sleep that you haven't had. You're catching up on the sleep that you haven't had all the time. Netflix is unfortunately a big problem, you know, binge watching series. And you're never going to study for 10 hours a day. And if you don't have study leave and you know you don't have study leave, you will work more consistently throughout the year because you know that you don't have this bulk time. So for me, study leave is a massive curse. But anyway, not very popular for that particular philosophy. <laughs> so having said that, it's, it, it's still a good question to ask what kind of support the office of offers for, you, yeah. for, for studies, not necessarily leave. So what some offices do, for example, is that they make their premises available over weekends right, and they'll do yeah, tutorial yeah. sessions where the managers or partners or directors will come in and actually spend time with the trainees mm. and help them with sections that are, that are tough. And I tell you what, that is absolutely invaluable. Mm. You can, you can forego all of the, all of the sexy clients, as, as you said, and all of the exciting work, if they get you through your studies and they support yeah. you and they get you through your training contract, mm -hmm. you will love your training experience. Yeah. And it, it doesn't matter where you are, it is going to be hard. No. It is going, and it, no, it's, it's part of what makes you, um, you know, I've been qualified for uh, so, <clears throat> over, like over 10 years, and I've worked in, you know, 
on both sides, all sides of the table. That don't, but you know, you can so easily spot someone who's gone through a training contract. Yes. There, yeah. you know, in, in all the, you know, in all the organizations that I've worked since then, and you know, all the people that I've dealt with at all sorts of different levels that you know are, are not qualified. There is something very specific about the way that someone who has come through a training contract operates, and that's without, you know, that's assuming that they have not qualified. You know, so they haven't qualified, but the training contract gives you, you know, people are calmer under pressure because they've been through like processes. They're able to communicate more. They they're able to sit back and solve problems. You know, the, the, their risk based approach to like what's really going on here. Let's scratch at that. Um, you can you can absolutely spot someone who's gone through a training contract because they're able to deal with so much more um, in such a professional way that mm. you know absolutely goes so far beyond I'm um, able mm. to you know compile mm. financial statements. Mm. You know? um, and it's again it's for these reasons that the exemption process and the RPL process is as stringent as it is because you want to make sure that whoever is a member of that profession has those abilities and has okay. you know is going to is going to continue that mm -hmm. you know um you because for all of, you know again for all the value that people want from the profession mm -hmm. you've got to you know you've got to make yeah. sure that that it is as stringent as it is mm -hmm. so for someone who's sitting going okay i'm getting towards the end of my first year now i've hated my life and i think it's my firm's fault <laughs> i think that they are you know, I think that my firm is worse than other firms out there. Should they, like, should they be speaking to Saika? Like, who would I talk to if I'm going, I, I don't think that this is the norm. I think this is beyond the norm. I think that this is worse than it should be. And I can't talk to anyone in my firm because obviously they, you know, should I, should I be talking to you? Like, what, what should I be doing if I think I, I really should move? Yeah. My telephone number and email address is widely distributed, and I am very Shame open to for you. <laughs> no, no, you know, having having said that, I've what? never found that anyone's abused it. Really? Um, well, that's fantastic. measured in terms of it. They appreciate the time that's given, yeah, um, and I am willing to have a conversation with any trainee who is in distress, right. and any trainee who's having a fabulous time too. They can also phone me. That would also be great. <laughs> <laughs> But absolutely, yeah. we would we would like to hear more from trainees. Um, okay. I, I'm very grateful that I have a project manager starting in about two weeks time. So hopefully it will also share the load a little bit um, and I'll be able to spend more time with that because I think those are the important conversations to have. They need right. to know that it's like a back then. And sometimes it's just not understanding um, how we monitor, how we make sure that they are actually getting the exposure that they need. I've had trainees come to me and say, you know, I'm really worried. I've got a development plan. Um, and I'm worried I'm not going to get my competencies by the end of the contract. And usually we're able to just talk them through what's actually going on and, and point them in the direction of what to ask for. Yeah. And that's enough. And sometimes we agree with them that actually we'll approach the training office and just say, can you give us some more information? And that just kind of smooths the, the way a little bit. Yeah. Um, just knowing that Psyche is there regulating some of the processes and monitoring and accrediting. Mm -hmm. So yes, we, we're always happy to get the feedback. And then the other thing that I say to trainees is that we, we visit between a third and a half of officers out there, all training officers, every year. Okay. So within a three-year cycle, we like to get to every single office so that a trainee would at some point be able to talk to a, a cycle reviewer. And during the trainee interview, that's a great opportunity for trainees to actually raise their concerns because the reviewers are very, very experienced. They've seen so mm, many of different offices yeah. that they can really provide context and perspective for trainees. Yeah. And, you know, they can also then, if there's a specific issue, they can deal with it in the monitoring visit rather than waiting. And yeah. then we're too late and the office is done just fine. And now we're sitting with a, with a complaint that we then need to deal with separately. It's something we could actually work on while we're there. Right. So it's very important that trainees actually do speak to Psyche. And really, as I say, my, my name's out there. If I, can't, if I can't help, I will point them towards somebody who can. Yeah. If it's more serious, then we sometimes need to get our legal team involved. But I mean, that, that's few and far between. The starting point is just to call us and ask if this actually is a problem. I think um, I, I'm, yeah. I'm so grateful to hear that. And I think so many people, because it, it definitely is, you do, you feel so alone. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, there's, there's like, you know, there's that conflict of like, 
I need, you know, I need to just suck it up and do whatever I need to do. Mm -hmm. But it, it would be really helpful if I could speak to someone who knows what's going on outside of my organization. And if I could speak to them and if they could tell me this is normal, then at yeah. least I could settle down and go, okay, I need to figure out a way to deal with it. You know, I need to build, mm -hmm. you know, I need to figure or they might go, no, 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 that's not okay. <laughs> you know, but then at least I'd know instead of, you know, instead of sitting here going, is it me? Is it them? Uh, is this normal? Is this going to help me? You know, is this going to be, is this going to damage my career? At least you do have, you know, you do have someone to speak to who knows what's going on. That's not in the organization that can kind of go, no, you're just, it's fine. Calm down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do some meditation, breathe. <laughs> we, you know, you, because we do, we need to learn uh, emotional management techniques and, and conflict management and conflict resolution, all that other stuff. But, or no, actually, this is, this is not okay. We need to. Yeah, this is not about it. And something needs to be done about it. Yeah. yeah. And it's very difficult when you're in that position as a, you know, especially as a first year trainee, how are you supposed to know whether this is normal or not? Yeah. Everyone tells you how horrible articles are, but what is horrible? You know? So yes. I think that is, that is incredibly valuable before you start. Okay. I'm just going to resign and leave and I'll take the six months and whatever chat, you know, have a chat first mm. and go mm. like, can, can, can you talk me through this? This is what's going on. Uh, you mm. know? So I think mm. it's, yeah, it's very valuable to know that, that you're not completely on your own mm. from, from mm. that perspective. I'd also, while, you, while you're talking about that, from what I've seen in training officers, there is a lot greater understanding for the importance of emotional and mental wellness, yeah. as well yeah. as the normal, I'm here to train you as a, as a chartered accountant or an AGA essay. So one of the first things I ask is what they've done about it. So often trainees will come to Psyche, but actually mm. they haven't even gone through the available channels that are there in the office. And sometimes there are reasons for it. Maybe those channels are actually not open. They could be advertised, but they're not necessarily that approachable. Yeah. And that comes back to our, our previous conversation. But often if they've had the conversation and it's, and it's tough, you know what it's like to have a difficult conversation. They, they, that's also a whole other skill set that mm -hmm. needs to be built. You know, yeah. and just a few pointers about well how to maybe approach the the situation mm -hmm. means that then they can go and deal with it yeah. and actually then they grow a, a professional skill they don't then have to rely on somebody else coming in so yes i think if even if it just motivates or gives them a different perspective or a different yeah. angle to approach things from it's useful yeah. to have yeah. outside that outside perspective it's yeah. it's definitely isn't if it's the if it's this your first working experience ever which for a lot of obviously for a lot of people it is, um, then, and especially with the, you know, with the personality of, 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 of accountants as well, we, we're not, you know, we're not naturally going to step forward and go, Hey, what's going on here? That's just, for most, that's not our personality. So I definitely find most, you know, most people that I speak to they're they take a very passive role, um, mm -hmm. not because they don't care, but just because they're kind of going, well, I'm in the system, I'm in the firm and I, just accept what's happening to me and I kind of follow what they're doing. Um, so when they, you know, again, exactly. So when they come and they speak to me, I go, have you spoken to anyone else about it? You know, have you discussed, have you mentioned, have you spoken to anyone? Um, and they're like, no, 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 I wouldn't know where to start or I'm kind of, if they're not doing it, then clearly it's just not happening or whatever the case is. I just have to wait. So there definitely is a need for people to be aware that they do need to take more initiative. And mm -hmm. if you feel that something is missing, it, it's not necessarily out of malice or, you know, vindictiveness no. or whatever. There may just be a case of, well, we've, you know, we've been really stressed out and, you know, we, we, we've been under-resourced. And so, yes, you've been doing, you've been exposed to the same competency for six months now um, because, oh my goodness, you know, like a bunch of people left or everyone's been on study leave or whatever the case is. But like, I'm so glad that you brought it to me. Mm -hmm. You're right. We do. We need to swap something out because you, you know, you need a different competency. I'm, you know, I'm so mm -hmm. glad you came to me. Otherwise, you just sit back and wait. Yeah. <laughs> you wait for stuff to happen to you and you leave it for, for too long. Yeah. Um, there so. is a competency that actually says that you take ownership for your own development. And I think sometimes trainees don't understand that this is exactly what we mean. 100%. You know, that we yeah. want them to participate in this process yeah. and that they should be asking questions, that they should be questioning where things are. Yeah. And Look, sometimes the, it, it's a conversation and a negotiation around, around it. And that, again, is a professional skill that they're learning. Um, but yes, as you've, as you've pointed out, ask the question. And then if you still believe that something is just not right, and you'll start, you, you start developing that gut sense, that professional judgment really sits here. You yeah, know, in your yeah. 
And if that's still niggling and you're still and losing so, sleep over it, yeah. please come and have a, have a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. hundred yeah, percent. Again, I think one of the, one of the things I'll say is like, <laughs> do not have these conversations when you're frustrated and emotional, because in a lot of cases, it's the way that you have the conversation mm -hmm. that drives the outcome. If you're tired and you're frustrated and you're annoyed and you feel that you've mm -hmm. been treated unfairly, that is not the time to, you know, to, Mm. to have that conversation because then everybody's back is against the wall. In so many cases, it's about how you raise the conversation and how you raise the issue, calm, set up an appointment with the manager, you know, where it's just the two of you and it's calm and it's quiet and you're like, I just want to have a chat. Can we talk about this? I'm a little bit concerned as opposed to, you know, running around screaming, you hate me and you're all unfair and it's all a big conspiracy theory because then that's, you know, that's going to bring, that's going to bring a wall down. And again, that's a that's part of the professional thing of like, can you deal with difficult situations? Mm -hmm. and, you know, can you deal with, uh, you know, with a calmness and with a professionalism that doesn't, you know, it doesn't make people go like, let me leave the room <laughs> kind of thing. So, yeah, I think um, I'm so grateful. Yeah. I'm so grateful that we, you know, I know the, the, the conversation is slightly off tangible, <laughs> slightly off tangent, but I think it's so incredibly valuable. Mm -hmm. um, and I think definitely not for lack of care, uh, not for lack of interest, but I, I definitely think that people don't understand that they can take more initiative and can take more control of their, their trading contract and their experience and, you know, than, than, than they necessarily are aware of. Yeah. Um, it's, and it is more about a conversation, you know, have that conversation yeah. if you're concerned. Um, and then, as you say, if you're still worried, then go and have a chat to someone. But you don't just need to sit back and then three years later go, yeah, but you never put me on X, Y, Z job. You know, mm -hmm. like, well, why didn't you say something three years ago? <laughs> and that's often the answer of the office. It's like, we, we could have done that. You know, um, if yeah. you'd only done this previously, it would have yeah. really helped. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, like, uh, you know, it's, it's not, you're not the center of anyone's world. Not in a, mm -hmm. in a bad way, but you're one of 20, 30, 40, 50 clerks. You know, for, for one training officer, for, you know, an office to manage and make sure that everybody's where they need to be is a pretty tough, while still making money, because the firm still has to make money. <laughs> they still have to do jobs, still have to service clients. So this is a very tricky thing from both sides. So if they're not doing something for you, um, it doesn't mean that they don't want to. And it doesn't mean that this is about you. It may just be like, oh, good grief. So much has been going on. I'm so glad you raised it. Okay, now let's you know now now let's deal with it. It's not necessarily a intentional, vindictive, malicious thing. Like just raise it and oh, so glad you brought that up. Let's deal with it. Okay, so I'm going to put up a whole bunch of links to the competencies, to um, you know, to, to stuff for people to take a look at. And um, I think this has given so much valuable information as far as someone shifting careers. Or considering shifting careers and even considering shifting articles, I think this is giving them so much, so much valuable information. So I really, I really appreciate, I really appreciate your time and, and, and all your input. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, if we have, if I have more specific or like additional questions that come out of this, and I, I, we, we need to have more discussions around CA 2025 and what that practically is going to mean. Uh, and you, you were saying competencies are shifting, you know, for, for in 2022. And I think it's really important to start having conversations about what that's going to look like. It's easy to yeah. say we need to shift away from technical to professional, but, you know, we, we need to have more conversations around what does it actually practically mean for me if mm -hmm. I enter, you know, if I'm, if I'm in first year now, if I'm in first year studies now, that's going to affect me, you know, when, mm -hmm. I, when, I, when mm -hmm. I sign up. So mm -hmm. I, I think I would love to have more conversations around that. Uh, as, as we go forward as well. So thank you very, very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.